So good morning everybody and welcome to this BIA webinar on advances in cell and gene therapy. Uh, my name is Steve Bates, I'm the CEO of the BIA uh, and I'm delighted that we've got a fabulous range of speakers for you today uh, on this panel. Uh, the speakers today are Sven Killy, the Vice President and Head of Gene Therapy Development at GSK. Uh, Sven is also the Chair of the BIA Cell and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee, and uh, I hope you'll uh, be able to talk a little bit about uh, the work of the committee. Uh, Emily Coulton-Seymour is the External Strategy Manager at, on G of Gene Therapy at GSK, and is going to talk about uh, GSK's uh, approach to cell and gene therapy. We're also joined by Michael Hunt, the Chief Finance Officer of Reneuron, uh, a key BIA member in this area, who is going to uh, give his perspective on uh, Reneuron's uh, advances in this area. And Damien Marshall, the Head of Analytical Development at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, uh, who will give us a, an update on some of the um, background technologies that are being used to uh, uh, deliver a quality by design approach to cell and gene therapy. I'm hoping that we can uh, get through the presentations uh, in around uh, around half an hour and provide some time for questions at the end. Uh, so with no further ado, I will hand over to Sven. Sven. Thanks very much, Steve, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. So as Steve mentioned, um, I'm the chairman of the BIA Cell and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee. Um, just a little bit of information about our committee. Um, we currently have 27 member organizations, and that also includes the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. And really what the advisory committee allows is a forum that um, allows us to discuss and provide updates within the cell and gene therapy and the regenerative medicine uh, sector. And it allows us to ensure that everybody, all of the member companies are really kept up to speed on the new uh, activities that are happening, the things they need to be aware of, and how things are changing. We have a number of areas of common interest with some of the other advisory committees uh, within the BIA, and this includes the regulatory affairs as well as the manufacturing committees. And as an example, some of the work we've recently been collaborating with them on is the uh, MMIP's Advanced Therapies Manufacturing Task Force. And so there's been a lot of really good work done there, and that really goes towards helping uh, further the cell and gene therapy uh, environment within the UK and hopefully the wider Europe. Um, we also get expert input, which informs the BIA positions on a number of policy issues that are affecting us uh, within the UK. And this includes things like the current uh, Select Committee Inquiry into Regenerative Medicine, uh, which was presented uh, two days ago and should be published very soon, and then also the Accelerated Access Review. Um, our focus in 2016 has really been to also explore different opportunities with Japan for a number of regenerative medicine developers and really increase um, the association and the collaboration that we have with our Japanese colleagues. As most of you know, the regulatory situation there is changing. It's becoming very much more of an exciting place for companies, and we feel this is a great way for the BIA to help open that up and allow and educate companies as to how they might uh, be able to expand into Japan and really be able to grow their capability, capacity, and businesses. Uh, so that's just a very quick overview uh, of what <clears throat> the Cell and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee has going. If any of this sounds interesting to you and your company is not um, represented, please get hold of us, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. We're always looking for, for good inputs and people that uh, can help and work with us so that we can work together and educate everyone. So thanks very much, Steve. So thanks, Sven, and uh, it's a really vibrant community in the Cell and Gene Therapy uh, Advisory Committee. I always enjoy uh, the engagement of it, and I think it is one of the areas where uh, the UK is really um, uh, le uh, leading with, uh, within, within the globe. Um, and that's why it's great to see GSK as a leading company within uh, the UK uh, having a big commitment to the Cell and Gene Therapy area. So uh, Emily, over to you to give us uh, GSK's approach to Cell and Gene Therapy. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Steve. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm the External Strategy Manager for Gene Therapy in the Red Z at GSK. So I'm just going to talk about our approach to cell and gene therapy and then just spend a, a couple of minutes on, on the, the industry as a whole. So as uh, many of us are aware, we've got some very, very exciting work going on in cell and gene therapy at the moment. Uh, this is really building on 
the, the historical use of pharma and uh, biologics and medical devices, and now we're moving to, to the new treatment modality of cell and gene therapy. Huge amounts of clinical development going on in, in a, a whole multitude of indications, uh, largely focused on, on oncology and monogenic diseases where you've got a single gene defect causing the disease. But lots and lots of activity going on uh, in early stage trials and indeed through to later stage two. Following those clinical investments, you've, you've seen lots of money coming into the sector. Uh, financing, private financing, VC money, also partnerships, and also government investments really, really being made in the field. So it's been a, a, great, a great time to be involved in the field. And indeed, GSK has been investing significantly in cell and gene therapy. So I'm going to just talk for a couple of minutes about two of our, our main activities in the field. We've got an autologous gene modified cell therapy program in oncology with GSK immuno oncology team with a collaboration with Adaptimmune and I'll, I'll spend a minute talking about that in a second but but firstly I'll talk about our portfolio in rare diseases looking at autologous gene therapy and this is together with TJET uh, in Milan uh, and this was an alliance formed in 2010 and this in, in TJET is a collaboration between the Telephone Foundation and the Hospital San Rafael, and we really have formed this strategic alliance with TJET to look at researching and developing autologous ex vivo gene therapy for a range of rare diseases. The first indication is listed here. It's adenosine deaminase deficiency, severe combined immunodeficiency, and this indeed, as, as many of you will know, we've um, been delighted to receive marketing approval earlier this year from the EMA for this indication. So this was a very, very exciting moment for us, for TJET, and, and for the field as a whole, I think. Uh, following the uh, ADA SCID indication, we have programs ongoing in metachromatic leukodystrophy and whisker aldrich syndrome, and also beta thal. And as you can see, there are three further indications uh, in this pipeline that are pre-option stage. So we have an exclusive right to, to in-license these, but these are currently under development by CJET. So all these indications, they're, they're rare indications, very serious, life-threatening. Uh, often affecting children and infants and uh, um, uh, in, in orphan ranges of numbers. And, and for, for a number of the primary immunodeficiencies and the lysosomal storage disorders, the, the current standard of care is, is uh, the bone marrow transplant options. But, but as many of you will know, there are toxicities, there are dangers involved with, with these treatments in terms of graft versus host disease, and improvements need to be made on, on the standard of care. So we're really looking to make those improvements for these indications using cell and gene therapy. In terms of the process, um, this, the cells are obtained from a bone marrow transplant from the patient. Uh, so you, you take the cells and then you isolate the CD34 population from that pool of cells. You purify those and then you transduce them. So this is where you use a modified virus where you've had the, uh, the, the viral DNA taken out of the virus and you're using that, that virus as a vector to deliver the DNA into the cells. Uh, and, and the DNA then when it's in the cells will encode the, the gene for the missing protein. And so once those cells have been transduced, they, they go through QA, QC release, and, and these are then administered to the patient, following some conditioning for the patient. Uh, and the patient is then uh, undergoes you know, long-term clinical follow-up to, to uh, look at the, the long-term effects. And uh, uh, happily, the data on the ADA SCID has been very, very strong. This has supported the, the marketing approval, as uh, I mentioned just before. And indeed, this paper was published um, just earlier this year, which shows an update on the clinical data for the ADA SCID program um, uh, with the with the TJET and the GSK teams, uh, showing that there was 100% survival for the 18 patients uh, treated on this program. Um, with long-term engraftment and immune reconstitution from the cells. So this was, this was a really exciting moment for, for, the, for the field earlier this year, and we're, we're very, very excited about this program. Following on from ADA SCID, we have preliminary clinical data from the MLD program. So we've had uh, patients treated uh, with a, a, a range of the uh, late infantile and the early, early juvenile types of disease. 
and we've had some very, very strong data coming out of the program there, which has shown stable engraftment of the cells and progressive reconstitution of the aryl sulfatase A uh, enzyme activity uh, in the patients. Um, and this has been uh, uh, seen in the improvements in, in the motor function uh, for these patients. So this has been really, really dramatic data that we're, again, very, very excited about, and we're looking for next steps for this program. And following the MLD program, we have the Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome program. And again, the pre preliminary clinical data is looking very strong. Uh, this paper from IUT in, uh, et al. in 2013 shows data from three patients, but uh, we've now actually treated nine patients um, at Hospital San Rafael under this collaboration as of April this year. So uh, again, we're you know, building up the data there and looking forward to next steps on the program. So beyond the rare diseases unit, we also, uh, as I mentioned, have activity in um, the oncology space, and that's uh, largely through a program with Adaptimmune, um, and this is a collaboration with Adaptimmune on their lead T-cell receptor program. Um, we signed this in June 2014, but we actually broadened this collaboration just earlier this year in February. So moving towards pivotal trials in synovial sarcoma and, and a number of follow-on indications here as well. So lots of activity for GSK. So I'll, I'll just spend a, a couple of minutes just reflecting, I think, on the, on the state of the industry. I think we've seen a um, huge, huge expansion of pharma interest in cell and gene in the last five years, maybe a, a slight shift from stem cells, redundant medicine, tissue engineering towards more, more cell and gene as as reflected uh, from the clinical improvements seen uh, from the use of gene-modified cells. And, and this partnership model has been largely focused on oncology and rare disease indications, lots of investments being made uh, in, a, in a multiple, uh, in multiple routes, early-stage startups, also publicly listed companies through strategic collaborations, but also direct investments to academia, excellence, I think we've seen a lot of that as well. And really, we've seen some excellent, excellent data and testing ground of cell and gene therapy in these diseases where you've got a very, very understood mechanism of action and you've got an identified target. And that's really where we're, we're starting to grow. And I think this, this shows a, a slight shift maybe in, in pharma uh, from building all the capability internally and trying to do it all themselves towards a more collaborative approach where you can recognize that innovation and discovery occurring in the academic and SME settings, but also recognize that pharma can bring that commercialization expertise and really have that, that complementary approach to, to, to move forwards together. So I think in the longer term, we're going to see uh, plenty more disease areas open up for cell and gene therapy. We're going to you know, grow the safety and efficacy data and maybe uh, start to see the shift in, in timeline of intervention move earlier as we see uh, cell and gene become more and more of a first-line intervention as well for a number of these indications. And we'll see, likewise, lots of the new technologies and emerging platforms being being applied as we as we build up the data for them and, and hope to deliver more value to patients in the long term. So that's it from me, and thank you very much. Emily, thank you so much. I think, as you say, it's a really exciting time, and it's fantastic to see uh, GSK get a first uh, therapy uh, in, in this area approved, um, which really does show that I think we're a uh, uh, developing in maturity in this space, and uh, I absolutely agree with your, your analysis that uh, there are now a number of players who are interested in this and are bringing different things to, to the party with different perspectives. Um, uh, even in the time that I've been at the BIA, I've seen this develop, and I can see that the, um, the uh, investment in this area and the development of the science in this area to, to a point of maturity, which I think is really, really exciting. And perhaps someone who's uh, had a, uh, who's been on that journey with us all the time is, uh, is Michael Hunt, uh, a long-standing BIA member and now the Chief Financial Officer at Renewron. Uh, Michael, if I can turn to you to give us uh, your perspective on where we're at. Bear with us whilst we get this ready. So, Michael, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thanks, Steve. And we can hear um, you. Great. So, over great. to you. Okay, I don't know if you can still hear me. I'm still getting the previous presentation here. Yep, we're just ah. changing that for you. So okay. uh, here you go. Uh, that's Wonderful. you. And here are your slides. Dude, let's go ahead. 
Great, thank you. Okay, right. I now think I have control. Yes. I'm hoping I do. You move? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Wonderful. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I'll spend a, just a few minutes giving you a quick rundown of where Reneuron has got to as, I suppose, one of the longer standing um, pure cell plays, um, pure cell therapy plays um, in this field. Um, and uh, for those of you that, that maybe don't know us uh, and what we do, um, we're a UK-based um, cell therapy player. We're a public company. Uh, we've been quoted on AIM since 2000. And Five, um, we've had uh, more than our fair share of hard times over the years in terms of the funding environment and how that's changed. Currently, we're in a pretty good position in that respect. We're, we're well funded and have um, a very nice uh, uh, institutional shareholder base now uh, and money in the bank really to get the job done. And uh, we very much bought into the idea of allergenic or, or non-patient specific cell therapies. And we've tried over the years to develop and refine technology that enables us to if you like, convert stem cell science into um, one-size-fits-all products that any patient that presents with a disease, uh, the targeted disease, uh, can have administered to them. So we're not reliant on the patient's own cells. Um, and that, uh, typically in the past, that's raised potential issues of uh, rejection, immune, immune response, and so on. Um, but I'll, I'll touch on that briefly as I, I run quick, very quickly through a couple of our lead programs and why we believe we've overcome that particular a uh, bugbear that's typically uh, raised when one talks about allergenic cell treatments. Um, as a company, we're, we're very much in our clinical phase now. We have uh, currently three clinical trials running. Uh, Retinitis pigmentosa uh, is our latest clinical trial that started this year in the US. That's a phase one study targeting that retinal degenerative disease. Um, we're probably best known for our uh, franchise in stroke or stroke disability more specifically, and that's currently in phase two. Uh, and uh, some data coming through on that very soon, as you'll see. Uh, we also have an earlier stage study going in uh, critical limb ischemia as well. Um, over the last couple of years or so, we've also developed um, uh, uh, an exosome, or the basis of an exosome uh, therapeutic uh, franchise, which uh, I won't have time to, to discuss in great detail today, but uh, we believe that's something that uh, the field and uh, more generally people will, will be hearing about over the next uh, few years um, if what we see uh, within that technology or that sub-technology uh, is exciting as we think it is. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more if, if there is time. So the basis of our technologies are cell lines or cell populations. Uh, the cell line that we've been working with for uh, many years now was derived back in uh, the early 2000s uh, was a cell line called CTX. It's an immortalized cell line. Um, a neural progenitor, so a multipotent cell line, uh, and immortalized, so it's an engineered product, it is genetically modified, and it gives us the basis to expand uh, those cells in great quantities. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, every cell within a cell line is the same, so it does give us, give us the, also gives us the basis of a very well characterized uh, cell therapy candidate. Um, so we're using CTX, this neural progenitor, in our stroke and, and CLI uh, programs. It's also the producer cell line for our exosomes. So we can harvest exosomes um, out of the process of expanding CTX cells. Uh, so the cell, cell culture process gives us the ability to harvest and then purify exosomes. Um, very briefly, exosomes um, are associated with cell-to-cell -cell signaling. They're rich in proteins and small RNAs that we believe um, uh, 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 may have be beneficial uh, therapeutic properties in their own right. So that's opened up a new franchise for us therapeutically uh, targeting cancer. Uh, our first target there is actually glioblastoma, perhaps unsurprisingly as those uh, exosomes are harvested from a neural cell line. Um, but it's very, very early stage, somewhat speculative at this, uh, uh, at this stage, but we hope it will form a, a very exciting new franchise for us as we move forward. Um, our second cell uh, product, which is a, a, a population of cells this time, are called HRPCs. That stands for Human Retinal Progenitor Cells. Uh, and this was technology we originally licensed from uh, Mike Young's lab at Scapens at Harvard uh, a few years back, and we've refined that technology built on it. Um, and that is the cell uh, population or the cell product that uh, went into the clinic uh, in the US this year in uh, retinitis pigmentosa. So essentially two, uh, two cell products uh, split across three clinical targets uh, uh, at the current time. So if I 
can move this on. So again, just touching on what we mean by cell product, I guess. Um, CTX, um, uh, which is the cell line we've worked on for many years, as I mentioned, is a GMP-produced, cryopreserved human, human neural stem cell product or therapeutic candidate. Um, we've cracked the very significant nut of uh, uh, cryopreserving this, this cell line. In our early clinical trials, it was, uh, it was administered as a fresh product with an eight-hour shelf life. We now have a cryopreserved formulation, uh, which gives that product a, a six-month shelf life. So it enables us to ship in cryoshippers uh, and store at site so that it can be um, uh, thawed and administered straightforwardly when required. So, so again, it very much sort of harks back to our desire to, to try and make cell therapies as close as possible to a more standard biotherapy, biotherapeutic um, paradigm in terms of manufacture uh, and then uh, cold chain distribution and administration. Um, so hopefully um, the basis of a product that uh, someone ultimately will uh, pay for and that can be adopted straightforward in uh, routine clinical practice in due course. Uh, a quick word on the pipeline, again, I've mentioned these target indications. Um, so this chart shows you um, in very sort of brief form where we've uh, got to. Uh, dark blue is where we're currently at across these programs. So as I mentioned, three in clinical development at the moment. Uh, exosomes hopefully coming up, uh, taking up at the rear there uh, in the clinic. We hope at some point next year all being well. And in the sort of green, the, the light green color there, those are, that's the next phase that we would hope to take these programs into um, uh, if we're successful uh, in their current clinical phases. Obviously, this is all dependent on getting the data that we, uh, uh, that we need. So just in the time left, I'll just take you very briefly through a couple of the lead programs, the program in retinitis pigmentosa and, and then the stroke program. And we kind of start with the retinal platform these days when we present because um, everyone is, is, is so sort of hung up on, on, on what we've been doing in stroke for so many years. But we're actually very excited by, by having got this retinal uh, technology finally into the clinic and in the U.S. as well. So this is the first clinical, U.S. clinical endeavor that we've, we've, we've ever done as well. So it's important for us as a, as a business operating in this space and as a U.K. business to, 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 to get this one through and, and shows that we have more in the kit bag than, uh, than just one cell therapy candidate for uh, one indication. Um, so as I mentioned, HRPCs were developed uh, out of uh, uh, Harvard in the States um, and really based around the notion of rescuing photoreceptors. So we're targeting this at diseases of the back of the eye that are characterized by retinal, retinal degeneration. Um, what we would hope to do ultimately is be able to both um, rescue existing photoreceptors and also get these cells, these um, uh, uh, retinal progenitor cells to differentiate into fully functional photoreceptors to actually restore to a degree vision in, uh, in these patients. And we do have uh, preclinical evidence uh, uh, that shows that these cells are at least capable uh, of doing that. Uh, no clinical evidence as yet, but uh, hopefully that will come. Um, and over the last few years, we've been working with a lot of clever people at, uh, at Scapens, as I mentioned, also at uh, Moorfields, of course, uh, in London. And a lot of the early workup actually was also funded by Foundation Fighting Blindness, which is a, a very large, uh, significant um, charitable foundation in the U.S. Uh, targeting uh, retinal diseases. So it's, it's great to have worked with those guys as well. First target is retinitis pigmentosa, um, which is a, an inherited degenerative eye disease. Um, what you get is, is a loss of peripheral vision initially, as you see in the image there, uh, followed by blindness over, over a course of years. Um, you can get this quite young, uh, and it develops over, over the course of uh, several decades, actually, in, in some cases, but ultimately leads to blindness. Uh, this is an orphan status disease. It's a large orphan disease, around 275,000 patients in the U.S. and Europe combined. Um, and uh, we actually do have orphan drug designation both in Europe and the U.S. for this uh, program and uh, fast track designation from FDA in the U.S. as well. Uh, and we uh, took this into a phase one, two clinical study in the U.S. earlier this year, as I mentioned. Um, this slide just gives you a quick sort of um, outline of what that clinical trial protocol looks like. Um, so it's a, a phase one, has a phase one dose escalation element. Uh, in three dose cohorts of three subjects. Um, we've completed the first dose cohort, actually. We announced that uh, last week, or sorry, earlier this week, actually. 
Um, and that's then followed by a further six patients um, in a phase two element. Um, we're actually taking functional readouts right the way through in all 15 patients actually in this study. Um, but the phase two um, part of it in those final six patients will be done at the highest dose or the highest safe dose that we identify in the dose escalation element. Um, a number of functional measures being taken, visual acuity, field, and, and so on that you would typically see in these studies. Uh, we're treating in one eye using the other eye in the patient, as a, I suppose, as a, a quasi-control. Uh, and the study's being run through a single site at Mass Eye and Ear uh, in Boston uh, under Eric Pierce. So we're, we're delighted to be working with you know, a, a, a fantastic clinical site for this study, and Eric Pierce is, is one of the leading KOLs in this field. Um, Michael, rather um, I'm, yes. Michael, I'm conscious that uh, we've uh, still to hear uh, from uh, from Damien, and uh, I, I'm keen that we uh, can uh, respect the time for uh, participants. Uh, can I ask you to to make some concluding remarks? Yeah, sure, I'll certainly do that. Um, so, uh, well, I'd, I'd, I'll avoid taking through the stroke program, which is kind of good in a way, but we published some phase one data in the Lancet uh, a few weeks back. So, if you want to know more about that program. I direct, you, I direct you towards that uh, publication, which you can get to via our website, and uh, I'll leave it there. Michael, thank you very much. It's great to see uh, Renewron uh, moving ahead, and I think, the, as you say, the, the, the new programs are really exciting, and I think it shows the adaptability of the, the company and also some of the, um, uh, the, the manufacturing and process hurdles that, uh, that you've overcome, which are important uh, in terms of the development of making this into something that's uh, 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 able to become a commodity, able to be, uh, to be moved, uh, and some of those challenges, which I think is, is where, the, where the sector's at. And I think that, that goes to uh, one of the roles I think that the Catapult has been vital in doing for uh, cell and gene therapy, which is taking some of the fantastic academic work and the fantastic work we've seen from the UK base and looking at some of the challenges that there are both in terms of the processes around research and the processes of commercialization. And with that in mind, I hope we can now hear from uh, Damien Marshall uh, from the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, who's going to talk to us about uh, the analytical platform for cell therapy product characterization he's been working on. So Damien, are you there? Yep. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can all hear me. Yes, we can. Excellent. So I'm the Head of Analytical Development at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, and uh, I'm just going to run you through the analytical platform that we've been working on now for about 18 months. And this was really set up in, in response to an industry need for better characterization and smarter characterization approaches for cell and gene therapies with a view that the more that you know about your product, the more you control that you can actually have over your manufacturing process. And this was what we, were, what we were often seeing when we were working with people and looking at their characterization needs is that people were really coming at characterization from a biological perspective. So if you were developing an embryonic stem cell line, for example, people were looking at pluripotent markers and that was the basis of their characterization. However, characterization really needs to take into, it, take into account a number of different factors, including things like the physical chemical properties, the biological activity, immunochemical properties, and also purity and impurities that are likely to be in your manufacturing process. And then by having that more holistic understanding of what's going on, you can start to get more control uh, of, your, of your overall manufacturing process. And when we're looking at the long and often complex manufacturing processes that cell and gene therapies have, then characterization becomes even more important. So the approach that we took at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult was to try and implement a more of a quality by design approach to, to characterization. And this is a risk-based framework which looks to try and relate the process attributes and product quality uh, in order to establish a framework for actually establishing what characterization is needed. And it's based on product knowledge and the engineering that's going into the manufacturing process to really design what is important. Uh, in order to measure critical quality attributes for a product. And these critical quality attributes, they could be the biological properties, they could be the physical properties, or they could even be biochemical uh, elements. And what you're looking to do is you're looking to create a design space with established, uh, with established ranges for individual characteristics so that you can understand when you've got control of a system and also understand when a system start to, uh, starts to go out of control or out of specification. Now, the difficult thing for cell and gene therapies is that quality by design approaches are usually done with the final product in mind. But for a lot of cell and gene therapies, particularly those in the early stages of clinical development, the mechanism of action for those products might be, uh, might be poorly understood. And so developing a quality by design approach with the, with the final product in mind based on, for example, the potency of a product is often not necessarily possible. So the approach that, that we had to take 
um, was to look at how we can actually implement a quality by design toolkit in order to develop uh, a smarter strategy. So what we tend to do when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at developing a characterization strategy is we break a, break a process down into its individual elements and we use a thing called a, a batch sequence diagram to do this where we look at all of the inputs into a process, what's actually happening within that process, what the outputs are, uh, what the environment for doing that, whether it has to be done in a, a grade B environment, for example, and what specialist equipment is needed for, for each of those processes. And that really breaks the process down into, into incredibly fine detail. From that, we can then, we can then look at doing a, uh, a, a process diagram where we can take each of those unit operations that we've identified within, a, within the uh, batch sequence diagram and link those to how they're going to affect the critical quality attributes of a product. And we use a really simple scoring mechanism for this because it is slightly qualitative at this, at this stage where we're, where we're scoring them for severity. And the idea here is that this is supposed to highlight which unit operations are having the biggest impact on a, on, on a product in terms of how they're affecting the critical quality attributes. From that, we can then do what's known as a fairly mode effects analysis, where you look at all the, all the different elements that can go wrong within a process, what the impact of, the, of, of those elements going wrong is, and how you can come up with mitigating strategies for that. And we use this as the basis for developing an analytical strategy, because by understanding what can go wrong within a process and what can influence what's going wrong, we can then, we can then design a strategy to actually measure the, uh, the, the cell and gene therapy products at those key unit operations. Now that also has to be done with a, with a view to what the future development strategy is for a cell and gene therapy product. So this may be uh, understanding what the future scale-up strategy is, so whether a product is going from a, a static planar culture into a, a dynamic uh, stir tank reactor and switching onto a microcarrier culture, what, what the physical chemical changes are likely to be as part of future development plans and also what changes are likely to incur in terms of the media environment. Uh, a significant cost of goods for cell and gene therapies is often, is often tied up in cytokines and growth factors which are, which are placed within the media. So understanding what the options are for swapping those out or changing the feeding strategy uh, is also important when you're looking at developing a characterization strategy. And this is all done with a view in mind of, of, of what the cells are actually going to see, how their environment's going to change, and what ultimately that could have in terms of the effect on the final, on the final product. So just to give you some examples of that, I've put three examples into this presentation, which hopefully I'll have a chance to run through, uh, run through quickly. And they, they increase in terms of their complexity. So to give you a simple example, this is, this is where we had a, a product that, had a, uh, that was passage based on time uh, with, a, with a qualitative estimate on uh, confluency. And in this instance here, what we were doing is we're just simply switching out uh, bright field images of the, of, of, the, uh, of the cultures over the various days of processing using uh, image, image, automated image analysis so we can identify where the cells are and then using that to track how confluency changes over time. So we can actually change a qualitative measurement to a quantitative measurement. But what that also allows us to do is it allows you to take all of that data and actually try and understand where variability is, in, where variability is happening. So in this instance here, you can see this is looking at the, passage data, uh, the confluency data for all of, the, all of the cells over all of the passages. And, and typically at day one, you're expecting between 30 and 40% confluency. But here, we, we actually see a range between 10% and 60%. So we know we're introducing a lot of variability into our system right from, the, right from the very start. So this is an element we can then go on and look at how we can get more control over. Of course, when you're looking at a scale-up strategy and you're thinking that you're going to go from a static culture into uh, maybe into a microcarrier culture, then similar principles can also be applied. So this is an example here where we're doing the same um, uh, confluency measurements, but now we're doing this within a microcarrier system. And within this system here, we, it's slightly more complex in terms of the characterization approach, but we're now teaching the software to actually identify individual microcarriers extract the imaging information for that, which is confocal imaging, so it's three-dimensional, and then essentially apply the principles of how you turn a globe of the Earth into a, a map of the Earth. So you're essentially unwrapping all of that information so that on each individual microcarrier, you can then actually see the confluence in the morphology, the cells, etc. And then we can actually apply that within bioreactor culture so that we can actually extract that information, look at the confluency measurements that are, that are of each individual bead and actually use that as a tracking system. So the principles are the same and the principles can be transferred from one system to another. It's just that the complexity increases as you, as you, as you change. But if you know that's going to happen right from the off, then you can develop this as, a, as, part, of your, as part of your overall characterization strategy. 
looking at something a, a little bit more complicated, this was, a, this was an IPS-based product, uh, and this was looking at how we can use um, a, a large screening panel to actually understand what's happening within the system. So this was designing a panel that's looking at not only the pluripotency markers that are commonly used when you're looking at when you're looking at these types of products, we're also looking at stress markers, markers that indicate when we're losing control of the system and the cells are differentiating. And in this instance here, we're doing a screen with 42 markers. But instead of having to try and look at all of the individual markers um, against, against each other, we can actually use mathematical modeling. In this case here, it's principal component analysis, so we can actually cluster this data. So we know what the phenotype is for an undifferentiated cell, and then we can understand what happens to those markers as they start to lose control and go down any of the uh, three germ layers. Just as a, a final example, for this is the most complex uh, analysis that we've done for, for, for product characterization. And this was, this was really an open-ended screen where we were taking information from a lot of different types of platform technologies, so flow cytometry, image data, PCR data, uh, cytokine secretion data. And we were looking at how we could use this to actually uh, develop a proprietary marker panel for an individual product. So what we had to do in this instance is we took all of this information, we came up with a normalization approach so that you can actually take the you can actually take this and compare it against each other. So from this data, we were starting out with 183 different parameters for 159 different time points. And obviously, if you try and look at this data individually, it, it would just take you it would just take you forever and would probably be quite meaningless. So we used a, a technique called weighted network expression analysis, which just clusters information based on how, how those markers have been expressed, irrespective of the uh, system that they came from. So we can see within these individual modules, it's just looking at how markers are expressed and how the, how the similarity in expression is between those markers. But the important thing for doing this is not that just that you can actually do this type of complex clustering analysis. It then allows you to do what's known as data reduction. So we could start out with these 157 markers, which is obviously a, a very large screen, and we can apply data reduction until we get down to the minimum number of markers you need to tell you the same information as those 157 markers that you started with. And in this instance here, we were actually able to take it down to 17 markers, some of which were just based on, uh, on cell counts and confluency. But the important thing is we could come up with a, a small select panel of six genes and six metabolic, uh, six uh, CD markers, sorry, that tell you all the same information as all of those other markers. And that became then the, the, uh, the panel that was used for, uh, for product characterization uh, during, the manufacture of the, during the manufacture of this product. And it also then allows you to, when you're looking to make changes to a product, understand how those changes are, uh, are um, affecting what's happening within your product. So that's, I think that's, that's the first idea. So that's, that's just a very quick overview of what we're trying to do. The whole point of the analytical package is to look at how we can, um, how we can support companies with their characterization needs, particularly as a lot of companies are under pressures, either financial pressures or resource pressures or access to equipment pressures, which means that this characterization can be a significant challenge. So the idea behind having this analytical platform of the Catapult is that we can make this available to support companies and make sure that people can actually implement a better characterization as part of the whole process development um, strategy. Thank you. Damien, thank, thank you very much for that. I mean, I think for, for me, my, my, and my learnings on, on this is when the process is the product, the crucial developments in some of these, uh, in some of this characterization, the ability to do this uh, at scale, uh, to get the uh, replicability, to get the um, uh, to get out what you want to get out and know why it's happening on a repeated basis is part of the devil that is in the detail of how you get from something that can work uh, perhaps uh, in a lab into something that's a scalable and commercial uh, business. And I think having the catapult in the UK really and the, the speed with which you uh, as a relatively new organization have got into some of these challenges, working on them and uh, have got to some capacity in this space is fantastic. And it's part of the mix that I think is uh, helping this sector to uh, mature. I'm looking for questions, uh, uh, and we seem to have defeated everybody uh, with the chat system here. So uh, I'm just going to uh, throw it over to Sven to reflect on um, uh, on what we've heard, and if you have any thoughts as to where the, the sector is at this at this stage uh, as we uh, at uh, September 2016, Sven. Yeah, thanks very much, Steve. I think you know listening to to these three talks and and you know in in interacting with lots of different. Um, other companies within the advisory committee, I think I'm, I'm really heartened and, and very excited that I think finally we've, we've sort of turned that road. For so many years we were talking about how to get through, how to get around, how to get over or under the valley of death. 
I think we're starting to figure that out, and as a group, we're starting to come through that collective valley of death, and we're starting to see some really good results come out. Um, and these are not just ones and twos. <clears throat> there are lots of companies and even lots of academic institutions that are starting to come out with some very solid results that are really starting to make a, a big difference in patients' lives, and I think that's really exciting. And then following on that, the greater scientific discoveries which are feeding into the environment and are really helping us to start looking at these therapies not so much as school experiments anymore, but more as viable alternative uh, to small and, and even larger molecules that really have a, have a massive difference. And so having groups like the cell and gene therapy, Caspult, based in the UK, being able to, one, develop that expertise and two, help companies in the UK and in Europe to really further their, their science and be able to develop products much more rapidly and much more efficiently is definitely going to be a, a huge benefit to, to the industry. So I see this as carrying on. I see us as having to really keep working hard to push ourselves and make sure that we stay at the forefront uh, and concentrate on being able to uh, fund these kinds of therapies and really support them going forward. So I think we're starting to see a new environment opening up where cell and gene therapies really become a viable, um, grown-up alternative uh, to medicines, making a difference in patients' lives. So we have a, a question coming in. Uh, now the industry is moving towards solid clinical trial results. What are the main challenges foreseen in clinical adoption and healthcare supply chain? Sven, have you got thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a huge question and a, a fairly enormous answer. I think there are We've been so focused on, on just being able to show the science and, and then being able to get these therapies into clinical trials and then get them through clinical trials that very often we've neglected what happens after you get a regulatory approval. And this is one of the big challenges, particularly that we find working with smaller companies is the focus is just on a regulatory approval um, and there's very little consideration given to life after approval and that really comes down to value reimbursement. Can you make this a viable product? Um, can you actually get it out and sell it? Can you, uh, can you get people to reimburse you and pay you for it? Um, and so I think this is, this is going to be a real, real challenge out there. And, and I would say to any companies that are, that are on the line that are really early, you know, even in, in before first time in man, think very hard in your clinical design about how you show value, not just safety and efficacy, but how do you show value and how, how are you going to have those value discussions with NICE and the variety of payers that we'll be interacting with, not only UK, Europe, but around the world. And I think that's really where our focus needs to go, to make a sustainable, commercially viable healthcare environment, uh, not just cool science anymore. I think we've passed the cool science stage. Uh, we need to keep going with the cool science, but we now need to become more grown up and, and think more about it becoming a business. And I think, Sven, one of the things that the BIA, I hope, can help uh, is obviously we have a number of commercial businesses that are engaged in that, in uh, large molecule or other types of, uh, uh, of business. I know that NICE have been engaged with the committee in some terms of some of their, their thinking. And I think if you look at the thinking that's going on through the new government's industrial strategy and the work that's being done through Innovate UK, they're very seized of what's the hospital of the future going to look like, what is it that you have to have next to uh, the... Uh, the um, you know the, the, the to, to enable the, the the products to be engaged with with patients, particularly if they're in an immunosuppressed environment. Uh, we looked at uh, Michael's talk about the importance of being able to move things around and um, you know uh, being able you know and I know that the work that you're doing with the the Italia, it's interesting that the partnership is not simply with a with a, with a, an institute but also with a hospital because I think some of the learnings that are going to come in here are going to have questions for healthcare um, healthcare provision. Um, and also the value proposition is different if you get to something that is uh, a longer term uh, outcome or rather than repeat dosing or can't be done at home and has to be done in a hospital setting. I know those are the discussions that we have at the, uh, the, the, the committee and uh, I think that you're right, that's where the focus may well be for us for, for some time to come. Absolutely. We have, a, we have a number of groups that are able to, to contribute to that, exactly as you say, Steve, and, and also companies that are able to help us bring this new type of thinking. And this is very often a new way of being able to treat patients, exactly as you've said. And so we need to be open to that and flexible. 
Um, we haven't touched very much on the, the area of, of t tissue engineering, and, and Emily, at the beginning, you thought that uh, the, the focus perhaps had moved slightly from there. Well, what makes you think that, uh, that, that that's the direction of travel now? Well, I mean, yeah, that was quite a broad statement, so I'm sure there's plenty, plenty of activity that's still going on in tissue engineering and, and lots, of, lots of growth in the field of biomaterials and trying to use cells appropriately, trying to construct them appropriately in the 3D structures. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's still a huge amount going on in tissue engineering. Yeah, my, my statement's quite broad. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's sort of that, that clinical adoption, you know, feeding into what Seth is saying. You know, we need to see it, we need to see it applied in, in humans and in, in surgical techniques. Thank you. I'm conscious that we've uh, kept everybody for uh, over half an hour. Uh, it's been a fabulous discussion. If I can, uh, I'll remind you that uh, the recording of this webinar will be distributed for you to rewatch or share with colleagues. If it's useful, it'll be on the BIA YouTube channel, and we can make sure the slides are also available. Now, I'm going to close by, if you've enjoyed this one, uh, you can come and see us in person, as well as just virtually at some upcoming BIA events. We have the Women in Biotech uh, networking event uh, next week with Kim Denny, the Chief Executive Officer of HVivo, speaking. We have an event in Stevenage at the end of September, a CEO dinner in October in London, and then perhaps the two that might be of most relevant to this group, the big autumn event for us is the Bioscience Forum on the 20th of October. And if you're interested in um, bioprocessing and also the, the work towards this in cell and gene therapy, our excellent annual Bioprocess UK conference in Newcastle at the end of November might be one for you. Uh, before we all get together to celebrate the fabulous successes of the, the, uh, the sector, uh, in January, at the end of January, at the gala dinner, uh, fabulous uh, event and uh, a must-do uh, in your calendar. With that, I just want to close by uh, thanking uh, our participants, uh, Sven, Emily, Michael, and Damien. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you've uh, found it valuable. Your feedback on this is always appreciated. Many thanks, and see you soon.